So good afternoon. I am Anto Budiarjo. Welcome to Monday Live. This is something that uh, we do every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, We're trying to uh, figure out what the future is for smart buildings and uh, figure out how we can improve it and uh, make this industry better. Uh, profiles of the panelists are listed on mondaylive.org. Uh, please head over there if you want to know who we are. Um, just one uh, important note, um, views expressed um, here are personal, not of any company or organization. And please do, please do um, post questions and comments on, uh, on, on the Zoom chat. Uh, we really um, uh, would like to get as much interaction as possible with, with everybody in, in, on this call. So please do that. And uh, also a reminder that this, uh, this deck is um, also uh, on mondaylive.org if you want any of the, the links that we talk about. Yeah. So um, this month uh, we are playing Family Feud. Um, those who were uh, with us last week uh, saw us uh, debating integration versus interoperability. And um, today, uh, after our normal sort of news and chit chat, um, we're going to be focused on the second um, uh, pair of topics, uh, in this case, open versus proprietary. So I'm sure we're going to have a lot of um, uh, opinions and uh, uh, debate on that one. So before we do that, um, Ken, what's going on in the, the Ken land? Ken land, okay. Uh, basically, we've got our uh, May issue online, enabling value by improving infrastructure. We kind of took that off of uh, last month's uh, Monday Live theme and put it a bit more into it. Uh, I just submitted an article to uh, Connected Contractor contexting our values. I started poking around and digging a little bit more into that. Uh, we had some great discussions on that. And uh, this was an interesting thing that context drives behavior, not values. Uh, and the choices we make at any given moment are driven by our underlying context, not our values. And uh, I think that's quite true. And I think we have to spend a lot more time uh, placing what our messages are into the proper context. So, because uh, that completely changes. And we, we often look at, uh, at IoT information and we say, yes, but that's not in our context. And uh, we have to kind of bring it into our context so we can communicate our messages. Uh, another thing that came caught my eye was uh, Google's digital building anatology. Anatology, is a triple that word? Uh, basically, uh, it's interesting. They're they're taking a look and they're they're building on uh, haystack and uh, brick, uh, but trying to again. I think that's facing into just adding context to what all of this information that we have in our bailiwick, and uh, I think that's. Uh, some good stuff, uh, you can agree with it or disagree with it, but uh, times are changing. Back to you, Anto. Thank you, Ken. Context instead of value. Context with value, presumably. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I have a slide, a um, couple, of, couple of things. Um, First of all, I've, I've mentioned in previous weeks, this uh, site IoT Analytics, they, they come up with some sort of interesting perspective. And this one is uh, global IoT market. Um, and the, the difference here that I've, I've not seen very much of is that they're talking about enterprise IoT and they, they're sort of uh, differentiating enterprise IoT from what we normally, what most people think about IoT, which is uh, consumer residential type IoT stuff you find in, in our homes. Um, so they've uh, focused it on that. And that led me to ask the question, what is really the difference between consumer IoT versus enterprise IoT, also uh, commonly uh, called as industrial IoT. And I found this uh, really interesting article um, on, on LinkedIn um, about the difference and that actually identifies, I think, five or six different areas, different attributes of difference. Um, and uh, this diagram, not easy to see here, but uh, the left here is the consumer IoT value chain, which is, as you can see, relatively simple. And the one on the right is the enterprise um, IoT value chain, which, as you can see, is a lot more complex. So that sort of uh, reflects a lot of the things that this group talks about, the complexity of, um, um, of the 
what we do if we uh, frame it as IoT. Uh, so that's kind of, I thought it was interesting. Um, um, but when it comes to monetization, willingness to pay, they make the point that uh, in the enterprise IoT is um, uh, much better in terms of uh, monetization. So I thought the sort of the combination of these two um, is sort of interesting. So. So, Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I was just saying, I, since I can't read it, um, what's, what are the buckets, what are some of the buckets in the enterprise? Just out of curiosity. Uh, out of the six? Yeah, out of the six. It's actually not listed here. Um, oh. One of them is monetization. Another one is um, uh, uh, value chain. Um, I can't remember the others, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, but it's not, it's not examples. So in other words, I was thinking enterprise <laughs> IoT might be, for example, um, uh, cars, you know, automobiles um as a something that gets oh in, in terms of differentiating between the enterprise and, and consumer yeah right yeah interesting uh it, i i can't recall what the article yeah, says okay. about that right. i'll say you know it's, it's the world we play and to me it's been so clear that you've got iot let's just say refrigerator sensor data to a cloud watch data to a cloud I, iot is the, it's what everybody here does. It's sensor data up, interaction back down, machines to machines. I mean, uh, to me, the, one of the clear differentiators is, yeah, willingness to pay. I really like that one because nobody's paying for their sensor data to the cloud from their dryer. But the, to me, they're apples and oranges in so many ways. I mean, running companies and industries and, and being able to interact both ways and having cybersecurity versus just sensor data to a retail cloud somewhere you know one thing that's interesting if you click on that and look at the diagram more closely <clears throat> they have the whole customer center circles surrounded by system integrator so in their mind there's always a system integrator involved with mm -hmm. every aspect of this mm -hmm. which goes back to our conversation last week about integration and interoperation, because uh, I would imagine the consumer IoT is highly dependent on interoperation because you don't have system integrators there. Right. It's a main differentiator there. Right. Interesting. Or on the consumer side, is it more do it yourself? That, right. That's kind of what we're talking about. Yeah. 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 My, my favorite example of this was a company called Tele. You guys know them. For years, this, this is 10, 12 years ago, they were doing quote unquote IoT. They were connected to virtually every Burger King um, uh, fryer machine in North America. They were getting all uh, six or seven really good sensor data points. All right. But, but, but boy, if they had to go in and do anything, it was a hard stop. They had no way to go back in, adjust anything, fix anything nothing they were literally like a one-arm paper care hanger if that's even a thing it was just sensor data to the cloud nothing else just a bunch of insights well bill do you equate that to them or do you equate that to the sign of the time and if you go back to that period which you're talking about our industry while we talked about data we didn't do crap with it Either. Yeah, it, it's definitely the sign of the times. It wasn't them, yeah. it was the technology yeah. available. It was the sign of the times, which is, this is what the beauty of the times we're living in with all these fabulous, there wasn't even really applications back then that even made it worth their while to do much more than do some historian or something like that. So it's definitely a sign of the times. And today, by the way, they're interacting heavily with all of those friars. That's changed completely. There was, also, there was also a concern, wasn't there, that people activating things off site, not knowing what was going locally on site. There was this concern that, you know, things could be done remotely rather than mm -hmm. just monitoring and telling people things were wrong. Mm. Yep. yep. When we mm -hmm. first started deploying systems mm. in retail, some of the biggest customers didn't want to be connected to the Internet. Right. And it was a combination of 
all kinds of different things, including what you just talked about. But in that space, it's heavily laden with franchisees who don't necessarily trust their franchisors and they don't want to share that information with the franchisor. Yep. So, yeah. All right. Okay. So, uh, moving on. Uh, any other thoughts? Any perspectives? I, I just saw a couple of things on the cloud infrastructure. It, it looks like at the moment, just on numbers, the percentage of, of shares is Amazon have got with AWS about 33% of the platforms. Uh, Microsoft with Azure about 22% and Google's 10%. And then the next 10 companies kind of make up virtually the rest. So the I saw that. The sort of you know, step away from from the smaller platforms now, the bigger ones. But the, the other thing I noticed was that so they're saying the adoption of smart watches is literally at the same scale as when, when the internet and uh, mobile phones started. So they've got the same trajectory where more and more people are now beginning to pick up you know, wear smart watches or Fitbits or anything that's kind of attached to your body. So kind of things they've been projecting about for years uh, about smartware and stuff is beginning to come a reality. You know, it's interesting you bring that up, Roger. My mobile phone died. I mean, it died, so I had to go get a new one. So I went to get a new one, and they that offered... That old Motorola one you used to have, you're talking about. That's, that's right, yeah. No, I still had the flip, <laughs> the flip phone, you know? but Or the shoe in my phone, uh, the, the phone in my shoe, like, get smart. But um, they offered me a package deal for the phone and the watch together. And I, I almost jumped, I almost did, but I did not do it because I did not want another thing beeping me or buzzing me, I, I'm tired of it. So, but anyway, but they grouped them together and I think you're gonna start seeing that more and more now. Yeah. Yeah. So before we jump, I've got one thing to add. So I was on a call last week with a major um, property uh, investment firm um, with a large portfolio of multifamily homes and uh, they aggregate capital and then they uh, uh, invest uh, in these properties around the country. And the, they're, they're interested in data analytics and the question is why? And the answer is ESG. So their investors, many, who, many of who are now um, coming from Europe are demanding um, uh, reports on the uh, and how the properties are being, what properties are investing in, and what are you doing in those properties to achieve uh, objectives around energy reduction, carbon reduction, uh, and they they're looking for some way to uh, to uh, get the data and be able to report so that they they can come back to their investors and show that they're. Uh, they're doing the right things. But the the whole reason for the interest in this particular company was ESG. And do they, Steve, do they know what data they need to give back? They to do them? not. Roger, they, they, back they, to their, their they, they do not. They, they admit that, you know, there's, it, it's still a, very much a guessing game. And they, uh, but, you know, the, the trees, people are shaking the trees now and saying yeah. you've got to do something. And uh, so now they're looking for people who can who can talk the talk and, and, and help answer the question. So on, on related to that, that's an interesting point. Rel related to that is that uh, we haven't finalized it. We'll probably finalize it by next week. Uh, but uh, we think that in June next month, we're going to um, dedicate the whole month on this various discussions around ESG. So that's the thinking and specifically how what we do in terms of data and smart buildings relate to ESG or how ESG relates to, to us. So uh, that's uh, the thinking for that. So um, moving on from here, um, we are going to play uh, Family Feud. And uh, as we decided last week, the, uh, uh, the, the pair of subjects we're gonna be focused on is uh, open versus proprietary. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to our very able moderator, Mr. Mark Peacock. Over oh. to you, Mark. 
thank you guys. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is exciting because I look at open versus proprietary. It's obviously for all of us on the call uh, and the attendees and the panelists, uh, it's one of the most talked about topics in our industry for years. I, we, none of us can deny that. And I think we all know kind of how we got here. So to get us started, let's, uh, let's start looking at picking sides. So I'm gonna start, I'm looking at my screen here. Bill, uh, are you gonna be open or proprietary today? I'm gonna be open. Do you wanna know why? Absolutely wanna know why. I'm gonna be open because proprietary after all these years has gotten us to about 16, one six percent of the of the buildings in the world connected and even slightly smart. It hasn't worked. Okay, good. Uh, Tracy. Well, <clears throat> I would normally be team open, but maybe I'll jump on proprietary just for sake of debate here today. Okay. Anto, open or proprietary? I'm going to go for proprietary, similar to, to Trace here. My, my natural instincts is, is openness, uh, uh -huh. but I, I, I would want to argue why proprietary isn't actually the opposite to open. Okay. All right. Uh, it'll be interesting how, uh, how you uh, bring that to us. I, I, that, that's interesting. Steve Fay. I'm, I'm going open. You're going open. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any particular reason why? Um, might have something to do with my recent background in the industry. Okay, that sounds. <laughs> that, we'll buy that answer. Uh, Roger, how about yourself? Yeah, I'm going open, um, basically because it gives the customer the options, both for you know, for, from hardware to software to distribution to to software, and uh, better serves the customer being open. Okay, Ken Sinclair. Open or proprietary? You're, you're muted, Ken. Yeah, sorry. No, I, I uh, the point I'd like to bring up is that proprietary has basically got us where we are. Uh, it's, it, you basically have to create these systems the first time and he, ever how that's done, uh, we have to, uh, you know, we have to have complete control. Once it's done, then we can start taking it apart and putting it into pieces. Uh, but uh, in the in the early stages, a lot of the innovation in the DDC systems was done by proprietary companies. So I'll chat a little bit about that. All right, Jim Lee. I'm gonna go uh, proprietary. I've spent cool. my entire career on open and solidly believe in it just, but for some devil's advocate reasons and to, to explore the concepts a little further, I'll go proprietary. All right, and Gina. <coughs> yeah, I'm going, um, I'm going to open. Um, it's actually the only thing I've ever known, so. Okay, well, you know, what's interesting is the sides are fairly even as far as numbers. There might be a little bit leaning, a little bit on open. So let's get us started. So I think um, for me is, Let's start with uh, the question. What truly is the difference between open and proprietary and what is the driving forces for your respective side, whether open or proprietary? Ken, let's start with you, your proprietary. Okay, uh, I think I'll go back to the beginning is when these automation systems were coming together uh, and I kind of grew up in that time in the uh, in the early 80s when the DDC systems were hitting. Uh, companies that had their own, even, proto even the protocols slowed us down because if we forced people to use BACnet before it was really ready to be used, uh, it, it basically killed innovation. So I was impressed in the early days as a consultant uh, to have companies that could give me a proprietary solution and I, I was looking for interoperability back in those days, which was difficult to come by, but the, the speed at which these folks could actually create these new systems and create new ideas uh, was very much faster in the proprietary uh, environment in the beginning. 
Uh, then as the standards became, uh, started to pr pressure on BACnet in particular, then uh, actually these people were quite, uh, the, the uh, proprietary companies were then quite able to move and use the open systems to their, their uh, best advantage. So I just kind of see it that it's, it's always needs a little bit of both and proprietary is not a bad place to start. If you're creating a whole new concept, let somebody give you the, their version of the whole concept and then we'll take it apart and fix it. All right, well, let's kind of keep, uh, I think the best way, so we're gonna go back and forth. Let's keep on proprietary for now, Jim Lee. So I, uh, as I said, I spent most of my career on open, but uh, primarily on BACnet and other open technologies. But then uh, I began to find out that customers had a different idea of what open meant. Uh, specifically, uh, after creating open technology for many years, we discovered that uh, Tritium and many of you on the call had a success redefining open as uh, the ability to have multiple dealers in a market uh, selling a technology. And uh, I always thought that was the most interesting thing that customers thought it was open when there was more than one person to buy it from, regardless of what the technology was all about. So. Interesting, interesting. And that, by the way, that was done purposely for those of us who came from the Tritium world back in the, back in the day. Anto. So, um, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I don't think they're opposite things. Um, I, I uh, increasingly these days, I'm thinking of um, everything as systems from a systems perspective. And the way to look at this uh, debate in a systems perspective is that what's important in a system is the interfaces, the external facing things that you can do with that system, what other systems can, can do with it, as it were. That has to be open. But what happens inside that system, what happens in, within the confines of that black box, if you want to think about it like that, like that uh, can very well be proprietary or open. It actually does not matter. And as per uh, Ken uh, and, and uh, Jim the sort of mentioned and, and uh, others maybe, uh, proprietary gives a lot more leeway to innovation and speed and everything else. So as long as that's maintained um, as something that's sort of inside the box and the externals are open, then you actually get the best of both worlds. So you don't actually have to choose between one, one or the other. Mm -hmm. So that's my argument. And for that, I've made this little <laughs> diagram. Oh, I like that. <laughs> you cheater, you cheater. Uh, Tracy, you're the last uh, on the proprietary. Sure, team. sure. So I'll just, um, well, first, let me say, I've spent my entire career kind of on the open side of things <laughs> and have debated this. Uh, so many times I, I've lost hair over it. Um, the, I, 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 I agree with everything that has been said so far. I don't think it's black and white, one or the other. Um, and um, as I have got more and more into creating platforms here with, with our company um, over the last several years, I start to understand that there is <clears throat> a very good place for what a lot would probably call proprietary. And um, some of the benefits that we see coming from this is um, what I would term as built for purpose, right? So when you get into applications, even networked applications that are going to share information, we all know in the building industry, there's no two buildings alike. There's no combination of products and platforms the same from building to building, <clears throat> excuse me. And while open, um, I think is important as far as getting access to data, I'm not sure that it's completely necessary that every system has to be built completely on an open foundation, let's say. That there is a place for um, innovation built for purpose applications within a system of systems, to, to use Anto's term there, that really uh, lends to a better overall customer experience and, and platform for customers. Okay, all right, because uh, I wanna be able to get to a number of topics, let's go ahead and move over to open. 
Bill, you're on the open side. What say you? Let's be careful here because we want to move things forward. Now, Anto is a wordsmith. He's for openness. And yet he's almost confusing the issue by saying, well, there still has to be proprietary and so forth, just like Tracy just alluded to. For, so, so, so let's be careful that we don't confuse the issue. For sure, there's going to be software and technologies and so forth that are going to be quote unquote closed with maybe patents or you know IP and so forth, but they're still in an open environment, meaning. And the reason I'm open for the open team is technology should, should democratize. We want to democratize cybersecurity and analytics and data and all of that. We want, we want people, we want the mom and pops to be able to do what the big boys have been doing for decades. So, um, and that doesn't mean there's not going to still remain some, some IP. You can have IP and be open at the same time. So I think we have to be careful how we're defining proprietary and open. Antho, is that fair, man? So maybe what you're saying is not confuse IP with open source or confuse open source with proprietary product. I didn't use the word open source. We haven't gone there. I'm just saying open. Yeah. And there's a there is a difference between open source and open. I think we right. can all agree to that. Uh, but again, we're not, let's not go open source yet. Let's finish talking about open. Roger, your comments. Yeah, so in, in defense of proprietary, I would say that it offers more differentiation, uh, innovation and kind of, uh, it's faster. Um, and, you know, when we started systems out, we needed to make it, and it worked better with perhaps the systems as a manufacturer you might have been supplying. But I don't think that worked in the customer's interest ultimately, because I think, you know, when you look at open protocols or platforms or distribution, um, my view was that you know, now, you know, it has, has been for a long time, you know, open communications mean that it's, it allows freedom of device connectivity, either, uh, you know, on-prem or, or off uh, through APIs and database compatibility. And I think it, you know, the open platform allows developments to be shared and kind of a community access and, and should also allow hardware, you know, being, being hardware agnostic. And it also means that if you've got that sort of solution, you're not locked in. And I think we've all been there before in the history where we've had proprietary systems and the customer has been locked in and he's not had the best of services or opportunities to get other, you know, other people to support or provide additions to his system is also, he's kind of almost been, been kind of uh, held to ransom. And of course, if that company or the people they've been locked into are not developing the technology or the products fast enough, then they can't always adopt those. So I, I, that's kind of where I, I'm coming from the customer side of having no lock-in. Okay, all right, and uh, Steve. So, Anto talked about the importance of open from an external interface perspective. I think that's really um, essential, but we're, we're really getting into terminology here and just I've been taking some notes so having worked for Tritium, um, as you guys all know I have, um, you could very easily argue that it's, um, other than the protocols, it's not an open platform. It's a de facto standard. And so when you can become a de facto standard, it can be confused as being open. Um, you can make the argument that all applications are proprietary, the actual application. Now, the degree that the data in the application can be made, made available to other applications and other potential users, all of a sudden that, that proprietary application becomes open. So um, I, that's why I get back to what Anto was saying in terms of the importance of the external interfaces being open, meaning they're, they're done to a, a known standard, um, industry accepted practice, 
uh, uh, of some sort so that the investment in, in acquiring the data and being able to work with the data um, is, is, is as little as possible. That's why we're advocating generally for open, not just for the lock-in issue, but from the cost of, of integrating or interoperating these systems. So open source was mentioned, as, as we all know, from a software development standpoint, the software engineers who are out there writing, writing applications are trying to leverage open source whenever they can because it's faster to market. Similarly, they're, they're, they're leveraging cloud platforms, whether it's Google or Amazon, with their platform as a service uh, back, back ends because they have all kinds of built-in tools that are now well understood. And the engineers get trained in them and they can get an application generated very quickly relative to what they might have had to create all on their own from a proprietary standpoint in the past. But at the end of the day, the, I, I, I come down to the importance of the external interfaces uh, being as open as possible and as uh, easy to use as possible such that we can integrate and interoperate these systems. Okay, all right. And let's follow up with Gina on open. Your thoughts, your initial ones? Mm, so that, well, you know, it's a tough group to follow and can't disagree with anything they say here. So I'll try to add something a little bit different. Um, so for me, you know, open, I always, I would love open source in that as well, to be quite honest with you, because I think when you look at some of the technology today, a lot of them leverage different open source technologies like Linux or Sedona or things like that. I do agree with what Steve said, that the application itself is inherently probably proprietary and your access to it is what we may be talking to, talking about. The other thing though, is when we talked about open, we, and I think someone touched upon this, it may have been Tracy, but you know, we talk about the, the system or the technology, but um, you know, also what we don't, well, what we don't talk about is kind of like the buying of it, the services behind it. It's, it's the being limited to um, <clears throat> you know, your choice of a vendor, your choice of a service technician. Um, to me, that's very proprietary, as well as you know, even with things that are completely 100%, you know, if you wanna call it open, can be implemented or installed in a proprietary manner. So to me, when we talk about open versus proprietary, it's the system, it's the, it's the architecture, it's the technology, uh, it's, the, um, it's the ability to buy it on an open market with open competition. It's the ability for it to be serviced um, in open competition. But overall, my take on open versus proprietary is that I think that being open spurs innovation and it spurs diversity, similar to what those applications that are open source do. Things like Android, um, Azure, um, Linux, and things like that. So I base my feeling on, or my thoughts, my opinion, based on how I've seen open source technologies um, uh, kind of uh, evolve in the market. And I, I think that that is something that we could learn from in this industry. All right, so let me, a uh, couple comments. Uh, again, I, we wanna try to involve the, uh, uh, audience as well from Steve Jones. Years ago, the definition of open was defined, declared in parentheses, by the manufacturers. Today, it is defined by users adopting standards. Just give me, let's go through the panel. Agree or disagree? Bill. I actually agree, and, and it kind of goes to stop. That's it. We, we're going to get that's all I'm going to give you, Tracy, on this question. Uh, I think there's more to it than just that. Okay. Steve. I, I would, if, if I heard you correctly, you're saying it's about standards. Correct. T today it's defined by users adopting standards. I think there's more to it than that. Okay, Roger? I think it's early days for us to be saying that the users are defining it. Yeah. Okay, Anto? Uh, it is a little bit more complicated, but fundamentally it's right because the users are the ones that benefit. Okay. So we're getting some differences. Ken? You're muted. 
You're muted. You're muted, muted, Ken. Sorry. I thought you were disagreeing with me. Uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, I agree, but it's the, uh, um, the fact that it's changed from to the user, I think, is very significant. Yeah. Okay. Jim Lee? Generally agree. Okay. So one other comment here that I see here, and then I'm going to go back to some questions here from uh, Joel Bender. Backnet got to the point where 60 to 70% of the market can communicate. So is this that open or proprietary? Jim, you're a big backnet guy. Why don't you start? I'd say it's open, but it's a wonderful thing. You know, the only problem is the things that aren't open are programming languages and configuration tools. So, you know, it's always a definition of what's open. But in terms of protocols, I think BACnet has been phenomenally successful and helped solve the open problem uh, in that domain. All right, Gina. Mm, um, uh, is it open or is it proprietary? Uh, I still call it proprietary. Okay, Roger. I think it's open. Um, but I think going back to something that Jim said is that if, if all the tools and all the other things are also identical, then where does the innovation come from? You know, it's all, all the same thing. But yeah, I, th I think BACnet as, as a protocol is probably open. Bill? I'll try to be brief, but I think about the other verticals where you got Profinet or Ethernet IP or BACnet. I have to agree with Jim that it's, open and serves a purpose for the interoperability and so forth. So I'll go with Jim on this. Okay. Uh, Steve, did I get you or? No, you haven't got me, but. Um, I don't, I'm not giving yeah, you so, two times here. Go ahead. Yeah, so the external interface is what it's been addressed. But to Jim's point, when you start introducing multiple um, vendors using BACnet, the, the issue of tools and, and support of those tools quickly creates a, a challenge for any company um, to try to really deal with. So maybe they can deal with two vendors, but they're not gonna put, they're not gonna do 10 different vendors of VAV controllers across their, just because it's back then, I, I don't see it. Okay, Anto? I, I think it's a maturity um, issue because if you think about it, any industry that starts um, in the di digital journey, um, any products in that industry has to be proprietary by nature because you're going to start with one and two and three, right? You cannot have an open system when you only have one. Uh, and so, uh, BACnet is an aspiration towards open, and one point at one point, hopefully, it will be 100% open. So. The 60 to 7 percent, 70 percent that Joel mentioned is basically a measure of where we are in that journey. 60, 70 percent along that the Jim net probably is, agrees with. The backnet's really mature. I mean, it's getting old age. It's getting close to its thirties, isn't it? <laughs> that, that means that the, maybe maybe this level is the the, the saturation level of backnet, which is another yeah. possibility. Ah, constant reinvention. It's always being reinvented, Roger. Fear not. We're going to keep it fresh. Roger, 30 is the, the new 10. Okay. That's right. That's right. Tracy, how about you? You want to comment on this? Please? I do. I do. I, 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 think, did, um, yes. I, I think the intention, the original people who worked on BACnet did a fantastic thing for the industry. And it had all the makings of a universally open protocol that could be utilized in, at least in our industry for buildings quite nicely. but then was um, unfortunately hijacked by industry and made into nearly nothing but proprietary implementations over the years. And, and that's the difference to me when it comes to open versus closed is, is does a technology or solution lock a customer into a specific set of tools or products or doing business with them mm -hmm. through contracting other methods. All right, I've got uh, several more questions to, to continue this family feud. So my next question for both sides are this is, uh, hold on, uh, 
How about specifying? Is it easier to specify open or is it easier to specify pri pri proprietary? So Jim, let's, you're on the proprietary side. So what's your thoughts? I think that it's uh, easier to specify proprietary uh, because you don't have to worry about all of the things that you have to worry about when specifying open. Uh, that said, I think that uh, you don't get the benefits of, of the open side, but it's certainly easier to specify by this. People have been doing it for a thousand years. All right, let's keep on the proprietary side. Anto. Muted. What was the question again? I knew it, you were going to ask Ando, that. Pay attention. This is the feud. <laughs> this is the feud. <laughs> How about yeah, specifying? Is it easier to specify open or is it easier to specify proprietary? It, I agree with Jim. It's very easy to specify proprietary uh, until you get to the point where the functionality of that proprietary thing is exhausted when you start to get outside of that. Then you, you start to get into trouble. All right. How about Tracy? I think it is um, way easier to specify proprietary. It costs less. It gets you faster to a solution. Um, the problem with trying to specify open is key, keeping and locking, or maybe I could use that term, locking out all the cheaters, the would-be um, dubious uh, players that would sell you an open system only to lock you in in another way later. All right, Ken. The uh, uh, the open or the, the proprietary is, is too easy to specify. That has been the problem from the industry is they basically choose one of these names and they say, that's the control system I want. They don't even know what a control system is. They just know the names of four of them. Sorry. All right, All right. let's hear from the, the open guys. Is it easier to specify open or proprietary? Roger. Yeah, it's dead simple to uh, to specify proprietary because I can be as lazy as I want. I just get my supplier to specify it. <laughs> Good one. Gina. Yeah, I kind of have to go with Roger on this one. You know, I can just yank whatever I used for the last 10 years and pop it in and I'm done and charge a lot of money. So, yeah, tons easier. Okay. Uh, Bill. I think it's the wrong question. It's such an obvious answer. The question should be more like, like what Ken started to say is, does the proprietary world and, and everything that goes along with it, including all the, what we're talking about now, does it hold the system, hold, does it hold the industry back? It holds it back. It's easier, it's lazy, and it holds us back. I'm not sure where Tracy went there with dubious and all that. He threw a monkey wrench into that, but it's lazy, it's easier, it probably is more cost effective potentially, but it certainly holds back the technology people on this call. Maybe I didn't make it clear. I'm talking about what it takes to, to correctly specify and procure an open system. Most of the effort that goes into that is trying to prevent people from then locking you in and resulting in a proprietary system. Yeah. Right. So just yeah, to make by the way, I don't think it's cheaper. And so somebody said cheaper, and I kind of parroted that. It's not cheaper because the stuff that gets uh, uh, specced in is it's it's do rigueur and it's expensive. Well, and they know uh, they can I'll argue in the short term, in the initial acquisition costs, proprietary is cheaper yeah. for a lot of reasons, and even just the specifying part that we're talking about, um, creating an open spec policing an open spec, enforcing, validating an open spec has been implemented, takes time and money and expertise. Um, and it's a continuous battle through the life cycle of a system once it's deployed. Because it doesn't end just once you install it and then you're up and operating. I, see, I can Lots take what you just later. said and turn it around. It's a continuous battle with the proprietor. You're locked in, man. You can't you can't dance and flow. Anyway. Well, I'm not right. saying that's not true either. By the way. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Steve, 
your turn to weigh in on this, and then we're going to move on to something. Yeah, I, I, the, only, I, I, the only thing I would add is that uh, going open is, particularly for government, is politically correct. Um, so whether it costs more to do it or not is almost not the, not the question to be asked. It's uh, the obligation they feel to, uh, to not be proprietary. Well, and, it, to, to not, and, and to look good to potentially to taxpayers who would complain uh, that they weren't able to bid on a project because it was spec proprietary. Yeah, and then uh, that kind of goes with what it looks like David Katz has posted here. Our Canadian governments at all levels now specify the open protocols like BACnet. And they were initially involved in CAB that was the forerunner to BACnet. So that kind of echoes a little bit about what you said there, Steve. So yeah. let me ask this to uh, those on the open side, what are the drawbacks to purchasing a proprietary building automation system? Anto. But you said that was for the open. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, you're right, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, so, Steve, let's we'll go back. Your background is confusing, Anto. It is. I'm so confused. <laughs> you got so, some blue in there, Anto. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, the interfaces. Yes, right. So, Steve, you're so for you. Uh, well, I think I think we've you know said it many different ways, but it's the lock-in. Um, okay. And then number one, and number two, uh, future proofing. So yes. when you go proprietary, you're no longer future. You have you might you might get future proof, but you're going to probably pay through the nose for it because the vendor is going to have to go in and add capabilities, and you're going to get hit with a big charge for doing that if they're willing to do it. Um, so yeah, and you know, and that's if you look at what we're trying to solve here with interoperability, one of the key value propositions is future proofing these systems because we know they got a long. A, a long haul, 10 plus years. And so proprietary just flies in the face of that. So let me ask this then, sorry, I'm gonna change a little bit here, I, uh, is this, does open or proprietary lend itself to the value of, or interoperability and the value of interoperability? Bill. I mean, by definition, I think you answered your own question. question. Um, so. I don't think so. Okay, I I, I'm trying to be neutral here. You guys have both, both sides have made some interesting arguments or points. So uh, what, do you, what do you say? I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna answer a little different and I'll give it to the next person. I'm not gonna answer the question, but I do wanna say this to all the people on the call. Are you running for office? Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> go ahead. Lest you think building automation is the only vertical with this problem, this exact same conversation happens in industrial. It happens in traffic automation. You have top two or three players. It happens in camera automation. So I'm going to let everybody off the hook a little bit. The exact same conversations are happening in every vertical. I'll just say that. And can, can I ask, is the, does, does that... <laughs> the, the sort of the notion of proprietary inside, but the interfaces have to be open. That presumably is also common in different industries, right? Pick, it, pick industrial. Siemens wants to lock you down. Rockwell Automation wants to lock you down from software down to the sensors, man. So it's that simple. So it's the same conversation. But isn't there a little bit of an argument from a proprietary manufacturer that and thinking of Apple here, that there's a lot more security that can be gained from a proprietary system versus one that is open. There's a lot of things like that. Stability, you think about the app world in stability, security, there's plenty of innovation on the Apple side. It doesn't that's have true. to be open, but around everything about Apple that's proprietary, they have wrapped open interfaces and access and so forth. And that's that's where you find you need a background like Anto, right? So the thing is, I don't think Gina that Apple's a good example of that. Because when I think about Rockwell or Siemens or these guys are well, often they're going and buying a bunch of little companies and putting them together anyway. Uh, so you still have the same issues. And in theory and in logic, it makes sense what you're saying, but that's really not the case because a lot of these 
big systems, they're branded one manufacturer or another, but often they're just cobbled together. Where, where Apple, they kind of developed a lot of their stuff on their own. Well, if you think about apps and accessories and stuff is, is I think what Gina is referring to. Yeah. Yeah. That part of it's all open. Yep. Jim Lee, any comments on the interoperability side of this? Open. Jim Lee is uh, offline. He had the internet ah. problem. He just texted me. Okay, thank you. Um, how about then, let me ask you a question, this. Let's do some future proofing. In 10 years from now, will we still be debating open versus proprietary? Or will one dominate <clears throat> open? Uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, Steve, let's start with you. Ten years from now, we're going to still be talking about this. Um, I think the comments I made earlier about the applications being proprietary uh, and the uh, the interfaces being open, um, I, I think from an innovation standpoint, uh, you've got to you're going to continue to see so much of the innovation be done in a proprietary because you're creating something for the first time in many cases. So you, you can't even necessarily at that stage conceive of what open should be. But we're so now connected as a standard, everything is expected to be connected, whether it's your browser or the internet or um, your phone. So you've got to build in open interfaces to whatever piece of proprietary to that technology you want to go build from now. So yeah, that I, I think 10 years from now, it's the, the story that you're seeing today is going to be still there 10 years from now. But I think the open interfaces are going to be better and easier to deploy. There are going to be more of them. They're going to be quicker to implement and plug into your into your proprietary kernel, if you will. So from that standpoint, I think it's gonna be a lot easier to be open than it is today. Tracy. I think the debate will be just as strong 10 years from now as it is today, because the driver has very little to yeah. do with technology, maturity, or innovation. The driver of this debate more than anything else is business and money. Right. The reason Rockwell and Siemens wants to lock people in the way that Bill describes <clears throat> is has to do with financial reward, not yeah. they're just as smart as the rest of us. They could do open just as easily as anybody. It's about controlling your customer, having that that lock in and lifelong relationship and their fi financial return that comes with that. So I don't see this ever going away. I think we'll chip away at the edges back to Anto's background and making integration and data exchange more open or more e uh, easier, as Steve mentioned, but there will always be a need or drive to do proprietary systems due to financial reasons. Ken. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's never gonna go away. There's the, the support and service, which we haven't really even talked about. That's another big piece of it. And that's probably, the driving force for a lot of proprietary, certainly in the old days, that was is to to basically tie up this maintenance and and have the complications of that uh, kind of part as your service. And we had situations where people would actually give you know very good prices to. Uh, I remember in the early days of Backnet, they would actually offer a credit not to supply Backnet, and uh, because that gave them a stronger hold to do the service and to support that system. So yeah, I think, think that'll always be there. Uh, the proprietary people are financial. Uh, they're driven and they go after the big financial companies, the universities, they try to capture them and, uh, and work completely with them. And of course, there's been a big pushback, especially in the university market, uh, that most universities have, have the where we're all to basically go open and have the people within and and kind of create their own system. So, uh, but I think the discussion will always be there for sure, 10 years from now. Panto, 10 years from now? I actually, I actually think that we don't want it to go away. I think this conflict between the two um, is not just an inconvenience, it's actually um, the structure that we want. 
because we want innovation, rapid in innovation to happen, uh, constrained in, in, in a box as it were, and the interfaces to be open. And that, that um, balance between the two is really what will actually move us forward. Uh, if everything's open, then we have to wait for everybody before anything can happen. And if everything's proprietary, obviously, it, we know it's bad for many different reasons. So I think it's it will all will always be there. Tina, mm, I think it will probably still be there for people that still make phone calls on rotary dial phones. So, <laughs> yeah, that's Mark, what I think. Please. Mark does. That's right. That's right. Uh, Roger, your thoughts. Ten years. Yeah, now. I, I think we're we're probably asking the the wrong generation. It'd be interesting to ask you know the Generation Z guys whether the you know they think it would be open or proprietary. You might get a different answer. But I I think there probably will or will there has to be uh, a hybrid. But I think what should really be happening is all the grunt stuff like protocols, data storage, interoperability integration should all be kind of, uh, you know, standard uh, and open, but you've got to have all the applications have got to be got to be proprietary. Otherwise, you haven't got the freedom to develop to put the stuff on top of it. So I think there certainly will be a hybrid, but I mean, we'll, you, you know, you need that, that proprietary side, otherwise you won't get you know, the, the, you know, the faster technology solutions for the applications that sit on top of what I think should be more the open, open side of stuff. All right. And then Bill, and then I got one more question, a yes or no question. We'll I think the answer is this. Absolutely. The same, the same, the same uh, uh, question is going to be here in 10 years and it's going to be companies we're not thinking about trying to take over that. It's going to be guys coming in from the side door, trying to be fully proprietary, and it'll be people we don't think about. All right, and this, this is sort of a, a follow-up to that question. It's from uh, Gregory. Is there a happy medium between open and proprietary? Let's just do yes or no, because we're at time. Anto. Uh, uh I think it's a balance. I don't think it's a um, happy medium. It's a balance between the two. All right, Ken. Yes, there is a balance. Bill. There must be a balance. There's no choice. Gina. No. Roger. <laughs> yes, I think it's got to be hybrid. Uh, Tracy. Yes, they'll always coexist. For different reasons. Steve. Yes, de definitely coexist. But uh, and, never, not, neither side is going to be happy with the other. And Jim Lee. Yes. Okay. Anto, let me turn it back over to you to close this out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think to me, the interesting thing is what Ken mentioned right at the beginning, which is the context. All right. If, you, if you're thinking of just the interfaces, then there's only one way of doing it, which is open. But if you're thinking about something different, then you, you have different views. So it, the context matters. But I think this has been a, a really interesting um, debate and conversation. Um, and uh, we are going to continue this next week uh, on a topic that we haven't yet decided. So we're going to do as we did last week, do another poll um, at, uh, at the beginning of the show next week, and we'll decide the, the, the topic or the pairs of pair of topics. Um, other than that, thank you, Mark, for moderating. This has been great. Um, no poll, Anto, did you? Oh, yes, we're yeah. going to have a poll. Just have, uh, we have this poll um, I'm going to launch and we're going to, which is really who, who made the best argument between these two? Um, if you can. Uh, and we can't vote. By the way, or we can't. We we cannot. Uh, the pa pa participants, uh, sorry, the panelists cannot yes. vote. Yes. Also, were you going to ask about next topic? So we get that figured out. Uh, I, I said we're going to poll the next uh, the next the week. the next Monday when we start Monday. Oh, oh when okay. We start. Yeah. Sorry, I missed so, that. So I'm just looking at the uh, uh, results come in here. I think the open crew is. Uh, uh, ahead here. So because we're out of time, I'm going to 
close well, this poll? Well, that means the open crew has to buy each of us and the and the attendees a drink. So yeah, there yeah. you go. Mm. Way to go, guys. Appreciate okay. it. Okay. Nothing different there for you, Mark. But it's the proprietary <laughs> people who have all the money. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm going to end the poll there. Thank you very much. And video will be up um, tomorrow-ish. Uh, and we'll see you uh, next Monday. Bye-bye, all. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.